we spent some time talking about now um, and have some lectures and stuff on on the properties of water and the geography of the ocean and all that kind of good stuff. Um, now we're going to turn to the main uh, types of topics we're going to be looking at in this class, which are specifically management challenges. So we've set the stage now um, for this place. Um, we obviously will have introduction to some things as we go throughout, but pretty much now we're pivoting to start to talk about management challenges. So I wanted to phrase our thinking about those management challenges um, as we go forward. So this is sort of a big picture overview. Um, and as we talk about our coast and ocean, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So as we talk about our coast and ocean, um, let's first talk about uh, this thing, right? This is this, this crazy powerful uh, place that that we don't naturally we 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 while we've we evolved out of this um, substance and we've we've grown up alongside this important um, aspect of our planet it still seems kind of foreign in many ways. Uh, one of our overarching ideas, recall, is that uh, that we'll be returning to, and you should be trying to think of how you might answer this as we go throughout the semester is. Has our coastal zone, has this area of our planet just gotten too complex to effectively manage? Manage, And so you should be you know, picking up evidence. Maybe you think, no, we can still manage it. Or maybe you think, yeah, it's too hard to manage. But, but you should be building evidence as we go across the semester. OK. But let's talk about how we've um, popularly thought about the resources broadly writ uh, in the coast and ocean regions of the planet. So here are some quotes. I'm going to read you guys just a bunch of quotes here. So this one starts in 1812. And this is about uh, the, the fishing uh, stocks on the, um, off the northeastern coast of uh, the U.S. And so the quote here is, The fishing banks are an inexhaustible source of wealth, and the fishing business is a most excellent nursery for seamen. It therefore deserves every encouragement and indulgence from an enlightened legislature. In other words, we should be exploiting this research resource as much as we can. Let's go do it, 1812. This is really um, uh, not just in, in political circles and economic circles, but this is widely penetrating across our society. So here's Lord Byron um, from one of his poems. So roll on, the, thou deep, dark, blue ocean roll. 10,000 fleets sweep over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin. His control stops with the shore, right? This powerful thing. We can't possibly fathom impacting this thing. It's, it's immense. Um, uh, a bit more recently now, now we're like late 1800s, um, and we talk about, um, now we're talking about a, the scientific perspective, Probably all the greatest sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say that nothing we do seriously affects the number of fish. And then um, jump ahead another 50 odd years or so into the um, uh, 20th century. And here's one view that is still um, uh, a pretty, you know, st still pretty pr prevalent by this point. As yet we do not know the ocean well enough. Much must still be learned. Nevertheless, we are already beginning to understand that what it has to offer extends beyond the limits of our imagination, that someday men, it's always men if you notice this, right? But, but someday men will learn that in its bounty, the sea is inexhaustible. We see this over and over again. Limitless, we can't possibly do anything to it. It's just gonna be there. But around that same time, 1950s, we start to see another perspective rise up. And this is perhaps best characterized by the work of Rachel Carson, who starts out as a copy editor for essentially educational pamphlets with um, uh, the federal government, and then eventually spins off into her own career as a writer in her own right. Um, and she says uh, in, in The Sea Around Us, which was part of a triplet uh, series of books that she published on the coast and ocean, um, uh, which was before, um, you know, DDT, before we got to Silent Spring and all that. Um, her initial passion was the coastline and the ocean. It is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea 
though change in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. So we're starting to see this, hey, maybe it's not just that we can dump whatever we want in there and we can't just harvest whatever we want whenever. Maybe something else is going on. And then uh, here we have a more modern view from Chesapeake. So the same area as our first quote, the, the New England, um, you know, northeast part of our country, the, the fishing community there. And here's a quote from this fisherman that says, most fishermen think that mother nature brought us them, meaning the fisheries, uh, took them away and that mother nature will bring them back again. The fishermen think that God brought us the oysters and God took them away. I think that God brought us the oysters and people took them away, right? So a more, a more modern view on what's going on here. Um, uh, but this idea has been, has, this idea of limitless, this idea of we can't soil this resource has really been at the backbone as to why we are where we are uh, now with our stuff. And then I'll just end with um, a shot here of Santa Monica. And uh, because I love noir, we'll end with a, a noir quote here. And so this is from uh, The Drowning Pool from Ross McDonald. And so this is the hard-boiled private eye. It's had a hard night and everything. And he, he goes and he, he walks through the water and, and floats in the waters off Santa Monica. And, he's, and, he, and he floats there, turns around, looks back at the Santa Monica Pier. And he says, I turned my back and floated, looking up at the sky. Nothing around me but cool, clear Pacific. Nothing in my eyes but long blue space. It was as close as I ever got to cleanliness and freedom, as far as I'd ever got from all the people. They jerry-built the beaches from San Diego to the Golden Gate, bulldozed superhighways through the mountains, cut down a thousand years of redwood growth, and built an urban wilderness in the desert. They couldn't touch the ocean. They poured their sewage into it, but it couldn't be tainted. There was nothing wrong with Southern California that a rise in the ocean level wouldn't cure. Right, so that was 1950. So, um, so even here, even in this, th th this recognition that we've done all this impact to the earth and we've had all these environmental harms happen, there's still the sense of the ocean as rejuvenation. There's still the sense of the ocean as sort of fountain of youth and as a source of, of beauty, which it still has, right? We, we haven't, the oh, ocean isn't gone. But again, even in this perspective, we have this notion of this incredibly immensely powerful resource that uh, we can till, still take sustenance from. Okay. All right. So as we go on the rest of the semester, we have various threats, and I wanted to sort of just organize our thoughts on these threats. Ultimately, the ultimate threat here is us, is the number of, of humans here on the planet. And that's sort of two broad flavors. So one is the total number of people. So right now we're about 8.1 billion-ish um, or so. Um, uh, today. And uh, forecasting is always problematic. My PhD is in population dynamics. It's always difficult to forecast far into the future. But, but the most um, common models now that the UN is putting out is about 10-ish billion people by 2100 kind of thing, right? And so the pink is the number of people that, have, that are on the planet, and the green is the growth rate. So, so how quickly we've been adding to uh, the, the rate of change of that, with the peak growth in the uh, immediate wake of World War II. So one is a number of people, which is, which is a challenge, right? Everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs that, that kind of stuff. And then the other flavor is the intensity. So, so of those people, how intensive um, uh, are, is their lifestyle? How, how much energy do they need? How much water do they need? How many resources do they need? So those twin things are together. And the story I always tell is, um, so several years ago, I was at a meeting in San Jose, the Society for Conservation Biology, and I always like to meet new people. So I always try to go sit with people I don't know or introduce myself to people I don't know. And so I happened to go to this table, and it was all these conservation, bi it was a conservation biology meeting, all these conservationists from Africa. I was like, cool, I don't know any of these guys. I'm going to meet these guys. So I, I hung out, and we had a great old time. And we were, you know, drinking and all that kind of stuff that I'm not supposed to talk about for the students, but whatever we were. And so then um, we started talking about challenges, like big challenges uh, that we we're facing. And it was very interesting. So they were all from uh, sub-Sahara Africa, and I was obviously from North America. And so we all agreed that the biggest problem was the number of people. Or excuse me, were, were, was, was, was humans were the ultimate, we we're talking about elephants and all these crazy challenges that were going on. And I said, yeah, the biggest issue is the number of people. The intensity, right, um, 
is also a huge problem too. I'm not saying it's not, but, but I think the number one problem is the number of people. And they said, ah, totally, we see your point. Yes, number of people is a huge problem. Actually, the biggest problem though is the resource uh, utilization. That's the bigger, that's the bigger problem. And, the, and, and so we kind of like, for about an hour, like, I totally see your point, but I'm right. And the other guys were like, oh, no, no, we totally get that. But we're right. And so we kind of went back and forth. The reality is both of these things are important. Some people, for political reasons, will have you believe it's only the number of people that is the challenge, ultimately. Others would tell you, no, 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 it doesn't matter the number of people. It's only the intensity. It's these two twin aspects of the same thing. So ultimately... It'd be great if we had fewer people and we use less resources uh, or use resources less intensively. Those are both going on. So that, that's, that's important to say and, and frames all this discussion. We can see evidence of this in, in many different ways. We already saw an example of this earlier. But for example, again, this is, looks to be a map of uh, the US, North America, but it's not. This is just light imaging, right? And so, so just from, we can use light as a proxy for how intensive um, our energy consumption, for example, is, right? So obviously here in, in Southern California, we're very bright yellow white in this, in this image, right? There's, we're using lots of resources. And in places like Florida and New York and Chesapeake Bay and places like that and, and, and around Chicago, you know, very, very bright. But in other places, like in the Intermountain West, it's, we're not using as resources as intensively, for example. Um, and then there's all kinds of markers of this, and you guys have had other classes on this, um, which is uh, we have all different kind of metrics we can use to talk about the changing of these resources. And so um, uh, fixation of nitrogen and all these things are, are changing and changing. And these are all creating challenges, not only in the coastal zone, but all around. Okay, so I want to frame our thinking uh, uh, or, or, or introduce our thinking as we get into these challenges with a couple different um, <clears throat> eras. We've already talked about the imaginary, the sort of the conceptual um, thinking of uh, uh, how we articulate the coast in, in this area. But now I wanna just talk about um, some of our management actions in a um, similar sort of timeline. So I have some eras here. So I have like way back in the day before humans were particularly abundant, so on the order of, you know, more than 40, 50,000 years ago, something like that. And then we hit this era of human expansion where there's more and more people and we spread to more and more areas of the globe, including the, you know, crazy islands in the middle of the Pacific. How do people find them that they did, right? So we, we got all over the planet. And that is going to go up to about 1,500-ish. And then we hit the the modern colonial era of the imperial um, uh, European powers that really sort of set the stage for our mon modern uh, coastal and marine exploitation. And that runs from about 1500 to, um, uh, we'll say, you know, roughly about the start of World War I, so the early 1900s. And then we have our modern era, which sort of picks up in the wake of then, say, call it, you know, 1900 or, 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 um, World War, II, World War I to about um, the pandemic. It seems like things have really shifted in the wake of the pandemic. And then we have, you know, now. So, uh, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time about those, those first couple ones. Um, we will touch on them when we get to talking about protected areas and fisheries and stuff. But, but suffice it to say, we weren't having a huge impact um, in those areas. Uh, when we get to the expanding human influence, we did start to have some impact uh, on some of our terrestrial uh, large uh, megafauna, but, but, but not, a, not a huge swath um, uh, uh, in terms of the coastal or marine area. Okay, so let's get to this sort of early colonial era. And so, um, so here we go. So uh, here's an example of, of the stuff that we started impact. So even though it, th we might look back on this time as these Societies weren't super sophisticated. They didn't have the kind of resources we had, didn't have the number of people, the technologies, et cetera. But nevertheless, we still had a, a relatively big impact. So this is the stellar sea cow. It's a, a, a serenin, so it's like a, it's like a manatee, a dugong. And this doesn't exist. You will never see one in your life because um, 
these, these guys were up and around Alaska, that area of the world. They're a manatee, right? They move slow. They're an air breather. They're a, they're a mammal. They need to be near the surface. They move very slow. They graze. So they're super, super easy targets. And so um, when the European powers get there, they say, oh my God, we can slaughter these guys. Um, not, I mean, I guess you could eat them, I guess, but really they were slaughtering them for their, for their fat, right? For their, for, to render their fat into oil so they could use that in lamps and various things. <clears throat> and so this critter was only described in the scientific literature in 1741, but by 1768, it was completely extinct, right? So this is the um, uh, uh, cl classic story of uh, you didn't need a whole lot of sophisticated technology. All you needed some guys in boats with spears, and you could essentially nuke the whole population over the course of a couple decades. Oh, and I should say, so I should say, um, this wasn't, there weren't, wasn't like a random dude here or there, right? These were relatively abundant organisms. And so those organisms are grazing kelp or eating seagrass or having other impacts. And so their removal begins to change ecosystems. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, when we jump to uh, the more modern era, we can think of things like, uh, like the um, early 1900s. Uh, and so the, the resource management era, era here is dominated, in our country, is dominated here by, by figures like Teddy Roosevelt, right? So very strong conservationist. Teddy Roosevelt's story is he goes, um, he was a sickly child. He's from a wealthy family, sickly child, had really bad breathing problems and stuff. His family sent him uh, to what we would call a dude ranch now. Sent, he's from the East Coast, sent him west, what we might call the, the, the Midwest, but, 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 but sent him west and said, hey man, suck it up, be a man, and do hard work all the time. And he really transformed himself. So he, he healed his physical ails and became a huge outdoors person. So he was a huge hunter, huge fisher, et cetera. So every day when he was president, he would read a book, like a whole book each day. And um, he would uh, frequently swim across the icy river that runs through Washington, DC, even in the middle of winter. I mean, he was a hardcore, he was a pretty hardcore dude. And so, so he looked on sort of a lot of these issues of coastal management as, why don't we do it? We should do this, right? Um, and so, uh, for example, some of his classic examples are um, the uh, uh, Panama Canal, right? It wasn't his original idea, but he um, kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, uh, Elon Musk didn't invent Tesla, but then he, he found an idea and then he took it over and then it became, it's become tightly associated with him, but, and he likes to tell everybody that he invented it, he did not. Um, and the same thing with Teddy Roosevelt and that he didn't, he wasn't the first proponent of this um, waterway um, you know, across the Isthmus of Panama, but he, it, he rapidly embraced it. And so he really got behind this as this idea of American imperialism. So no longer is it just the European powers, we can do whatever the hell we want in areas around the world and, and exert our influence. And so that had huge impacts on the, the coastal um, uh, critters um, in that part of the world. But he also had some, which we I think now, generally speaking, while the commerce part is good, the environmental impacts are pretty bad. But he also did a lot of stuff. So he created, for example, the National Wildlife Refuge System. He really was the father of our modern thinking, you know, U.S. Forest Service, all that kind of stuff. And so this is him sitting at one of the very first uh, refuges, which he said should be set aside simply to protect these life forms, not because they have a commercial value to us or, or, or utilitarian value, but, but inherently this life has worth and we should not just wipe it all from the face of the earth. And so, so, that's, so that, that, that era begins in 1900. We have a lot of power here and we're realizing we have a lot of power and we like to exert it, sometime for good, sometime for evil, but we're, we're sort of getting really comfortable with doing whatever we want uh, because we, we think we should. Okay. Um, we, in the wake of World War I, um, which was, you know, at the time described as the worst thing ever, trench warfare, which unfortunately we're seeing again in Ukraine and in and, and Europe again, which is crazy, but, um, but we are. It was such a horrible war, it was such a horrible experience. In the wake of that, people really wanted to do something different and, and, and have a different, and, and we're really excited to do things more um, uh, 
positively. And so, for example, we get this large-scale environmental transformation of places like Los Angeles. So this is a plan for uh, Los Angeles that had, you know, a lot of a lot of parks, a huge amount of parks. Most of LA would be a park. We didn't that didn't survive. A few elements survived that we now call Griffith Park and things like that. But but this huge vision um, didn't persist. But nevertheless, we were thinking on the grand scale of transforming the coastal zone in places like that. Um, because we had the ability to, and people were, were empowered to, to do things differently. Um, then we have World War II, which was, uh, you know, World War II was horrible for, um, for the environment if you were experiencing the war, but if you were areas outside of the war, it wasn't necessarily the worst thing. So it provided a reprieve of for example, large-scale fishing in a lot of the world because it was too dangerous. People would mine areas or, or things like that. Um, but then once we leave World War II, all this technology we develop to slaughter one another gets turned to, in many cases, resource exploitation. So in particular, the more efficient engines and winches, uh, sonar, radar, that type of, of new technology, which didn't exist before World War II, or at least didn't exist in any kind of practical real sense, uh, airplanes, satellites, all these things really transform our, our, our resource exploitation um, in, in the ocean and coast. And so, so I already mentioned uh, Rachel Carson's Sea Around Us, um, uh, uh, which was sort of um, one way of taking some of the new technology and, and using it to educate people, right? Uh, nature documentaries and things of this nature to show people these parts of the world that maybe they hadn't seen, especially things like underwater, which where most people uh, you know, had never gone. And that's Rachel Carson off on the right hand side. Um, but then we um, really also turn in a big bad way. So today I was just reading a new study of um, plastic packaging. So not, not, of, not of the waste that we throw in the ocean or microplastics, but the packaging itself and how many compounds from that package, when we buy our apples or get our takeout tomato soup or whatever it is, just simply from contact with the packaging have been identified in human blood, hair, uh, and uh, um, uh, blood, hair, and whatever the other one is, I can't remember. Um, and so, so that really is, is a consequence of World War II, right? Or, or, or the technologies we develop in World War II and then start to proliferate them. So for example, uh, DDT, DDT actually was bef started before World War II, but really gets going in a big way in World War II. And again, DDT was an example of some, people were not trying to screw over the environment. And in many cases here, people are not trying to destroy the planet or cause harm. They feel like those quotes that we started this with, they feel that this was an unlimited thing. How can we possibly hurt the ocean? How can we possibly do whatever? They just thought these technologies, by and large, were helping us do these things more efficiently, saving us time, being more elegant, or, or that kind of stuff. And so DDT is perhaps a classic example of this. And so the idea here was, hey, it doesn't affect vertebrates. Supposedly, it does. But the thought was, hey, it doesn't affect vertebrates. It only hurts the insects. And we hate insects. Insects are horrible. So what could possibly go wrong if we nuke all the insects, right? Um, and then, and, and so that's sort of like a societal level wide. But then a direct example of this is what we've now discovered across um, the LA basin. Um, uh, this is, so how do we do, how do we do with this D DDT when we, when we were done with stuff? Originally, so if this is our factory in here and we're done for the night, I just give Angelina the hose or whatever and she would hose down the place. Hose down the equipment, hose down the chemical, you know, bin and the, and, and the hopper and everything. And it would go into a drain in the middle of the floor and that drain would go um, not into the, the toilet or the sanitary sewer system, but it would go into the storm drain system. The storm drain system would go into the drain, which goes to the bigger drain, the bigger drain, bigger, and then because of where this was manufactured, White's Point outfall off of Palos Verdes, which we know is now slipping into the ocean. That's another coastal management challenge. Um, and, and we just dumped this DDT. So the largest concentration, environmental contamination of DDT in the world is off of Los Angeles, and in the, in the, in the water's just off of Los Angeles. Partly that's because we rinsed stuff down, but it's also because we did this. So in some cases, we just put the stuff in barrels, and literally drove them, you know, 15 minutes from the, from the coast, stopped, and kicked them off the side of the boat and just left them, right? And so that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at this 55-gallon drum that's sitting in, I don't know, I can't remember this picture, maybe like 200 feet of water or something like that. 
uh, just sitting there leaching out DDT. Same thing off of the Farallons. Hey, where are we going to put all our radioactive material after we've been making all these nuclear reactors? Let's put them on a boat, drive out, you know, off the Golden Gate Bridge, and then just kick them off, you know, just knock them over, and we'll dump them. Uh, yeah, so, so, so Willow's question is, hey, did, did, did we use DDT on the islands? We didn't use DDT on the, I mean, I'm sure somebody did. The Vale and Vickers probably did, knowing those folks. But, um, but, uh, uh, but nobody act, it, was, it wasn't a huge amount of it. Rather, what happened was with the story of the Channel Islands is um, that DDT was impacting, so in places like this, right? So if we, if we take this example here, um, uh, we contaminated the, the, the sediments, let's say. And so the sediments are contaminated. So now the worms that are in the, the in fauna that are in the sediments, for example, are, are picking up a body burden of DDT. DDT is interesting in that it's lipophilic. So it's one of these categories of compounds that really attaches to our fat cells. And so, um, so, so it, can, it can build up in critters. And so now, now we have some of this, um, what we call body burden in, let's say, the worms in the, in the sediment. Okay, so now the, the halibut comes up or the fish comes up and eats, eats that worm. And now that fish is beginning to accumulate that DDT. And then the seagull eats the fish and the seagull gets it. And the seagull goes back to the rookery on the Channel Islands. And so that, that's sort of how we get it there. So it's more of a food web transfer as opposed to directly spraying it all over the islands per se. Um, okay, so, so this era is this one of we're, we're literally just throwing stuff in the ocean by insane volumes, right? In addition to extracting stuff a lot, we're also putting out a lot of stuff. Okay, that leads to, amongst other things, um, the, the birth of the modern environmental movement. And this leads to the 1970s, which, which many folks regard as this golden age of environmentalism, certainly in terms of large, powerful laws, both at the state and federal level, really come in this era. So Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the EPA, right? This is Nixon um, uh, 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 creating the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, uh, and, and then on the right is the... Is the um, uh, campaigning for what would become the Coastal Act um, in San Diego. Uh, and then we see all these other problems. So then we start to see oil spills, which again, we'll talk about later. But, but you know, so we're, we're seeing the, the, the foot, the impact of these, these decisions that weren't particularly regulated, that weren't particularly controlled. And we begin to see by the, by the late 60s, early 70s, some significant harms that can come in their wake. Um, And then we have the, and I, I should also say, I think I, I skipped a lot of this, but a lot of this was also in the context of the Cold War and World War II, right? So, so why would we question, is this a bad thing? Because we need to make more DDT. We need to make more nuclear reactors. Because if we don't, we're going to be crushed by the evil commies, right? And the same on the other side, right? Why should we talk about, about environmental protection? Because these Imperi American imperialist capitalists are going to come destroy our society, right? So that was absolutely the dominant narrative. That finally breaks down with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the uh, early 1990s, and it continues into the, into the late 90s. And so by the time we get to 2000, we supposedly are supposed to be in a different era. So now we're not in this global Cold War thing. There's, there's just, at the time, just quote unquote, one superpower, us. Right, so it's great to be king, right? So we could do it, ah, nobody's challenging us. So there was supposed to be, people talked about this, all this so-called peace dividend. Now all this energy we put into war, into building bombs, and now we can start to do other stuff. But unfortunately, um, uh, we have the events of 9-11 and all that stuff that really ignites the, the, the modern war on terrorism, right? And we see at the same time this beginning alongside of that, this so-called illiberalism. So this is not liberal in terms of, in terms of um, you know, what political side of the spectrum you are, but rather um, liberal in the sense of um, the institution of government. So we start to see this rise of things that are anti-democratic, anti-government, 
anti-participatory, et cetera. We've already talked about right here, we've already talked about the Chinese moving in, wanting to expand and take over parts of the South China Sea. Um, we start to see um, people talking about um, aspects of fishing becoming now underneath this thing. So this war on terror, we're starting to see uh, gangs running uh, essentially slave, slave fishing operations. Right, and then that fish is hidden, and we, we it comes out as something you buy in the supermarket here in the U.S. And so all these things are starting to get confounded and and complicated. And that's basically the era that we've been in for a long time, where this era of the golden age of environmental laws and stuff is beginning to seem um, like it's not working super well. And then we hit our current era, which is the pen, which which seems to have there really seems to have been a huge shift since the pandemic. So that's sort of our, our current, current era. And in this era, which goes from maybe like the great resignation to what people are calling the great reshuffling and the remote work and all this, all these kind of things that you guys are all uh, experiencing every day. But um, we're seeing very strange, uh, strange manifestations in terms of coastal and marine resource management. So... Um, so, you know, these are some people in Orange County saying that the problem isn't the global virus, the problem is media, right? And th things of that nature. We're like, wait, what? And so when we start to get to this level, even having the basic conversations about how many fish are in the ocean or how fast are the cliffs eroding, it, it becomes even hard to have those conversations. And so things are getting into a very strange time in terms of management of the coast, but that's where we are. Uh, Gavin Don't Surf is on the right. That's the same thing. So that's um, so that was also from Orange. That particular picture is also from Orange County, and that was in the early days of the pandemic when um, uh, folks said things like, "Hey, nobody can go to the beach," um, and and that became policy for a while. Uh, the governor was out in front of this and the governor was, you know, daily press briefings and stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. And so, so these guys were angry that they were not allowed to go to state beaches that were closed and various things. So they said the governor clearly doesn't surf because if he did, he would let us surf kind of thing. So this was, this was, a, it was an anti, anti, uh, uh government protest or anti lockdown protest is what this was. Okay. All right, so uh, let's, okay, so, so that was a bit of an intro. Okay, so coastal stressors. So here's some, a bit of an overview of our coastal stressors. Um, so these are all things that um, aren't necessarily a death blow, but these are all things that um, might cause us some problems, right? So let's talk about these, some of these stress. Oh, sorry, questions about that. Other, I'm, I'm talking a lot now. Is that, Will, is there other, other, anybody else have other questions about any of the things I just talked about that? Does that make sense, that sort of brief era? Overview, sort of familiar with the other stuff you guys have been reading, other classes, yeah? Okay. Um, all right, so uh, these things that stress our coast and ocean are either abiotic or biotic, so they're either living things or they're heat or, or a chemical compound or something like that, so abiotic or biotic, and they're things that impact ecological functioning. Right? We can also have stressors that impact our socioeconomic functioning, but to start with here, since we're talking about our resource base um, you know, as the starting point, we're primarily talking about things that stress the ecological dynamics of a system. So one, we have these, they're just, these, these stressors exist, right? They, they're just here, right? So, so, so they in and of themselves are there. But then Add to that, they're starting to change. So that they're, they're starting. So the delta here. So they're they're they're, they're starting to um, uh, change in a bunch of different ways. So in particular, the magnitude and frequency of the stressors. So we've always had hurricanes, let's say, but now we're starting to see stronger hurricanes, and they're coming more frequently, right? That that type of thing. So it's not as if we've never had hurricanes before, but the way they're playing out appears to be different, appears to be relatively new. Historically, and we have a, a specific question about this on our, our opinion poll, historically, um, uh, the dynamics of the coastal zone and ocean 
were driven by natural forces, natural factors. But as we've seen over time, more and more and more of, of the, the dynamics are being influenced by us. So, um, so this question is always very interesting when we ask people, what do, what do you think is having more an influence? But it's absolutely objectively the case that humans are having a much stronger influence than say we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Um, uh, that, that, that's, that's not at question. And then when we do have any one of these things happen, any one of these abiotic or biotic stressors happen, what's starting to happen is we're seeing expansion of the space and the time over which those impacts um, play out. So whereas it used to be um, maybe when we have, let's say, uh, some problem with coastal flooding, maybe it's in this one town or on this one creek or something of that, that nature. But now as we see these you know, rising king tides and sea level rise, now we're seeing that impact all up and down the California coast, for example. So it's no longer constrained to just a little time of the year or a little particular village or something. Uh, some of these stressors, not all, but some of these stressors are now beginning to get to the point where they're starting to um, uh, impact the potential resiliency of these ecosystems. So the potential, the ability of those ecosystems to bounce back from a stressor, everything can bounce back from some type of stressor. But there's also a stressor that's so great, it just nukes everything. Think of like a nuclear bomb that comes and just boom, burns the whole, you know, knock, takes the whole forest out. And so some of these stressors are beginning to get to the point where they're reducing either the resiliency, the ability to bounce back, or they're knocking us to alternative stable states. So something will come back, but what will come back is not the ecosystem, let's say, that was there before. Okay. Um, and so we, we have poll data on this, right? We have poll data on all these things. And so some of these, you know, again, we, we, we've made a much smaller poll this year than in past years. So some of these questions we left off from this year's poll. Others we've just haven't, we've we sort of asked for a few years and not, not answered. So let's go through some of these. This is one that you guys are asking, that, that you're going to get some current data on um, this semester. But for example, when we ask the general public, hey, is it, is it nature? Is it people? Or is it both that have the strongest influence on, on the dynamics of the coastal zone? Um, what we see is that, the, that um, a very small percentage of people say it's, it's nature alone. And it's, it's very close to our margin of error, right? So it's a few people. There's definitely some people that think that. But it's vanishingly few, right? Um, the vast majority of people say humans are the strongest influence, right? And th th if you recall, the question says, which one is a bigger influence? It doesn't say the other thing doesn't happen at all, but it just says, what, you know, who, who's the head honcho? So the vast majority of people think it's humans, and then a, a somewhat smaller number think it's, uh, it's both humans and nature. Either way, humans, most of the public recognize that humans are impacting our resources, which is important, right? It's important. So when we go in these conversations, most people, at least some, at some level, they get that we're having some kind of impact, right? We might not agree on what to do, but, but that's, a, that's a positive thing, I would suggest. Um, yeah, so 92% think that people at least play some role in this. Um, and this is a question that we don't ask anymore um, because everybody was exactly the same. It just got like, seemed silly, but we asked it for many years. And this is, um, uh, so at one time we asked it specifically about fisheries, about the coast generally, and then wetlands. Um, but it's the same story basically, th basically throughout. So we ask people to rank what are the greatest threats to these wetlands or coasts or fisheries or whatever. Um, we asked a few more questions in, um, in fisheries. We added in increasing temperatures and ocean acidification, but, but we can ignore that. Let's, let's look at the coast. Let's look at this middle one. So red is pollution. Green is habitat destruction slash habitat fragmentation. Uh, purple is over harvesting of a resource. And then blue are, are invasive species. And essentially, since people have been asking this question in the 70s, humans always answer the same way, or, or the average populations always answer the same way, which is, and so, and so the left here is the greatest threat. And, and as we go to the right on the, on the axis here, that's 
um, less of a threat, right? And so, and again, these folks are asked to rank these, these, um, these points. And so, and there's actually error bars on here that are just so small, you usually can't see them. So always, always, always pollution is perceived as a number one threat. Always. Yep. We're, we're burning oil or we're spilling paint or whatever. And these other threats are always much farther down the spectrum, right? And so the next thing people talk about is, is habitat fragmentation and then over-harvesting and then invasive species. So almost nobody thinks of invasive species as, a, as an issue that are impacting our resources. And similarly, most people don't see over-harvesting, taking too many things is not particularly, not, not a huge deal. Um, so, so we've seen that over and over again. Um, okay, so let's, we'll, we'll, we'll do two more slides and we'll take a, a break. Okay, so um, in practice, this is what we see. In practice, this is what we see. In terms of what's going on out in the waves and, and out in nature, we see and sometimes an individual stressor is a problem. A storm, say, blowing in. So that's a problem. But we're also seeing increasingly this notion of synergism or synergistic stressors acting together. So, so we see something like, um, what would an example be? So uh, uh, something like a sea level rise combining with that hurricane so that when the storm hits, way more areas are inundated than, say, uh, were before or areas are more vulnerable to that. And the impact is not just from a little bit of sea rise added with a little bit of hurricanes, but it's actually way worse than, than either of them uh, separately or together. And then in society-wise, what we're seeing, the big threats here are very conflicting priorities, which we read as politics, right? As some people think we should do everything, other people think we should do nothing, and, and that, that sort of inability to move forward, that sort of polarization um, causing issues. And then, and, and so that, that, that's of like motivation from we as, as citizens that might vote on things and stuff. But then also what we're seeing is more and more institutional ineffectiveness, bureaucracy, dysfunction, right? right uh, um, analysis paralysis. We're, well, we'll just study this for another 20 years. Let's figure out what, what we should do, right? So I'd say these, these are key threats. So in nature, we're talking about individual things, and then how those things combine together in a synergistic fashion. Those are sort of the key issues. And in society, it's that we can't agree on which way to go forward. And then the institutions and the, and the tools that we've created um, have increasing dysfunction and, and are, not, are not as powerful as they once were. Okay? And then we'll, I'll just put this slide on and I'll introduce it and then we'll take a break. So... So here we go. So here are the main, uh, so most of the things we'll talk about this semester will fall into one of these five broad categories. Uh, or, or at least you can initially put them into one of these five broad categories. Um, so over-harvesting, taking too much of a biological resource, too many trees, too many fish, too much kelp, that kind of stuff. Um, the next one is pollution, where we're putting out non-living things into the environment. And so uh, mostly we think of like proximate pollution. Mostly we think of the stuff coming out of the smokestack or, the, or the, um, the lead leaking out of the cut line or something like that. Um, but I'd also say um, climate change is one form of this. Now, uh, climate change is to the point where some people argue we should have that as a separate bin. But in terms of the conceptual layout here, that's essentially a form of pollution. Right? And it, it's causing all these big changes and all this stuff, but, but ultimately it's, it's coming from our emission of greenhouse gases and our fossil fuel intense uh, economy and society and energy systems. Okay. Uh, and then a third broad category is the loss or the degradation of an ecosystem. So either something completely obliterated or, or is, is fragmented and, and no longer can perform the same way. So we have general habitat uh, loss or, and I say habitat because that's what everybody says. 
and this is super annoying, but you guys know what I mean when I say habitat destruction. So really what we're talking about is ecological destruction or, or an ecosystem fragmentation. Habitat is technically, te I put it in quotes here, because technically habitat is defined by an organism. So habitat is, so habitat for a snake is where that snake lives. So if I wanted to define the habitat, I first, have, I first have to say, hey, who's the, who's the organism we're talking about? And the habitat for the snake is going to be different from the snail, which is going to be different from the mountain lion. Um, but it's become popular parlance to talk about ecosystem fragmentation and loss as habitat loss. So I'll, I'll just, I've lost that battle, right? There, nobody, very few people agree with me. But, but, that, but, that's, but just to be clear, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, okay, so there's, there's general fragmentation and destruction that goes on. And then there's a particular thing we'll focus on in our class, which is, which is coastal development. So the, the hardening of the immediate coastal zone with either piers or seawalls or parks or roads, that kind of stuff is, is, is a particular uh, problem. And then there's the, so this was the putting out of abiotic things in the environment. This is putting out of bio, biotic things, living things, right? So, so introduction of compounds and, and substances and, and energy. This is introduce, introduction of things that didn't used to be there. And then this fifth one is, again, as we've touched on, this institutional ineffectiveness. This, um, this inability to, uh, to have these societal tools that we've agreed upon and put together, they aren't working maybe the way they, they could. And that's for a couple different reasons. One, that's because inherently, even if everything was ideal, inherently this is a very, the coastal zone as we've talked about is a very, very difficult place to work because everybody is spatially on top of each other. The shipper and the cruise ship liner and the parasailing tourism thing and the folks that want to have the sunset view from the restaurant, they all want to be in exactly the same place. So by definition, there's, a, there's much more overlap than in many of our resource management domains here. So inherently, there's just overlapping uses and this is always gonna be a problem no matter what we do, A. B, this era that we're in now, we talked about which is maybe as a society, we're not all in agreement of what our priorities should be for that, those overlapping uses. Um, and, and less deferential to um, you know, professional actors that have dedicated their careers and lives to figuring out how to do this efficiently, less less uh, respect. So, so, the, so the, if we had to break down the stressors into some categories, you guys should use these categories. Overharvesting, pollution, habitat loss slash uh, degradation or fragmentation, uh, introduced species, and institutional ineffectiveness. So let's see, let's look at these things and see what our, our data show from previous years. Again, um, some of these questions we're not asking this year, some of these questions we are asking, so you're going to be adding to our understanding here. But the first one is, okay, so uh, let's see, fisheries management in California. Are we, are we, how is our regulation? This is a question we've asked in some years. Are we over-regulating it, doing about right, whatever? Um, the, the most common answer is most people are unsure. People don't, you know, most of us don't know the specific rules of fisheries regulation, so that's, that's understandable. Of people that do have an opinion, um, very few people th perceive it as over-regulated, right? So most people think we're either doing it about right or we need to do more, right? Which is, again, in contrast to mostly what you hear in the newspaper or the media, right? People say, oh, we're, California's over-regulated to the hill, to the hill, to the hill, to the hill, right? Um, so that's not how people perceive fisheries management. Um, and then a question, we ask this question now just about ge the general coast and, and ocean. But um, for some years, we also asked specifically about fisheries, how, how healthy they're doing. And most people, um, you know, a large fraction, 40%, I don't know, I've never really thought about that. But about half of the people think um, fisheries have declined um, over the, and, and very few, only about 13% think they've improved as a whole since in the immediate wake of World War II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more abundance, more diversity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's one we've asked uh, every year forever, and this is, hey, how, what about endangered species laws? Are we are we doing this right, or 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 how's it going? 
So essentially, nobody thinks we should eliminate this. This is essentially just about the margin of error. So nobody really thinks we should eliminate these things. Um, some people don't know, a, sm a small percentage of people who don't know, but this is a relatively small percentage uh, compared to a lot of our questions. The, people definitely um, are much more likely to express an opinion when we ask about endangered species um, as opposed to other uh, uh, domains. What we see is more than half of the people, or with, with margin of error, you know, about half of people, um, think we should expand protections for endangered species. Again, in contrast to mostly what we hear in terms of uh, the rhetoric. Um, only about, only about, so if we add the eliminated to made less severe, only about 10-ish percent of folks think we should be doing less to, to, to help uh, species that are disappearing. Um, when we talk about, uh, and, and, and I would say that, that a lot of this is an over-harvesting I have this here in overharvesting because um, while maybe it's a pollution thing, it's most of the things are because we're taking too many critters out, out of the system. Okay, let's talk about pollution. What do you think about pollution? So here is a question we're not asking this year, but we asked for a few years about our cap and trade program. The cap and trade program has been changing, so it got a little bit confusing to keep asking about it the way we were asking about it. But um, so this, is, um, this comes from our AB32, our landmark climate change legislation in California, uh, uh, created by one of our uh, local um, uh, former elected representatives, um, Fran Pavley. But, um, but basically, this is, uh, uh, I don't know. So most people, large chunk, about 60% of people, like I, I, I don't know the specifics of cap and trade, so I, I, I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, uh, but if we, if we add people that think it's bad or very bad to people who think it's good or very good, we end up with about 17% people thinking it's good and about 11% thinking it's negative. So the, the people that are neutral are about positive. So people don't have an over, overwhelmingly um, glowing view of our cap and trade. And again, this was this effort to try to, um, the idea here is that not all industries can eliminate or control their, their pollution as easy as some others. So the idea is if I am better than the average, I can um, reduce mine more than I need to and then essentially give those credits to somebody else so that they, they would pay a fine or whatever and, or, or, or pay, me for this, um, pay me for this commodity of, of pollutionlessness um, and, and we can have net reduct, the idea is you have net reduction in emissions um, as opposed to making every single emitter always emit less. The idea is to, in aggregate, emit less. Um, so, that, so that's one example of how people perceive pollution. Habitat loss. So this is one about wetlands. So we ask people, hey, have wetlands um, increased or decreased since, we started, since the state of California was founded about 150 years ago? And most people uh, correctly claim, 65% of the people feel that it, the extent of wetlands in California has gone down, which is correct. But uh, they, understandably, because people don't think about this, their, their quantification of that is really wrong. So if, when people think it's, it's changed, um, uh, about 16% of the people think it's changed a little bit, like about 20%-ish change. About a third think it's changed, you know, from about 20% to 40%. About a third of think, think it's changed from about 50% uh, to 60%. And about 20% uh, thinks it's this. This is the answer. So the answer is we've lost 91% um, of our wetlands that used to exist 150 years ago. So almost all of our wetlands are gone. So it's not, not a little bit of a difference, it's a massive difference but only about 10%-ish of the people actually um, understand that. And again, this is important for conversations. If the vast majority of people maybe think things are changing, but think things are changing a little bit, we're gonna have different conversations about policy, different com conversations about recommendations, different conversations about what is environmental justice. So it's important to understand where everybody's coming from. Introduce species. So this is a question where um, every few years we ask, but it, it ends up taking up a, a whole page and it, and it 
it sort of dominates the survey. So we're not doing it this year, especially during the presidential election year. But, um, but uh, uh, the idea is here, we, we give people a range of different management things in the coastal zone. And then we say, okay, from really good to really bad, uh, you know, how, 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 how is this fair? And so this is, um, and so this is uh, people think that uh, removal, removing uh, non-native animals on our, on our California Channel Islands scores about uh, 0.8, which is on the, on the positive side. Um, uh, and I would say in this scale, the, the most positive thing ever is 1.11. And so this got 0 0.88. So this is, this is pretty positive in terms of the scale. So this is, this is near the, the most popular type of things um, in terms of managing these endangered species, or excuse me, uh, invasive species. And then lastly, with institutional effectiveness, so are we, are we doing too much or should we do more? Again, the rhetoric is often that, the dominate is that there's too much bureaucracy and there's too much ineffectiveness and all that kind of stuff. And we need to stop, 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 stop. But the vast majority of people, about, about a third, or two thirds, excuse me, of people, think that we should be doing more in terms of governance, in terms of managing these resources. Um, uh, yes, okay, yeah, I'll just say that. We can skip this next one. Um, okay, and then uh, just end here with a little bit of comments on synergism to make sure we're all on the same page. So all the things I've talked about so far are examples of an individual stressor, an individual thing, an individual topic. Um, but they can act together. And I just wanted to give you guys some, an example of how these things can act together. Synergism. So here, this is, this is from a paper on um, uh, wetland loss, salt marsh loss. Okay, so on the axis here, this is the, how much of our, so low is we didn't lose anything. High on the left axis here is, is we lost everything. Okay, so we have, and they were looking at, in this case, uh, critter, uh, uh, cows and things eating the vegetation and sea level rise. So these different, different categories of stressors. And so when we went to a, um, we just looked at the effect of sea level rise in the next few years, the estimates were um, that we'd lose about 13% of the salt marsh. Then we looked at if we just had um, the same amount of grazing that was going on and you know, is not, not changed, we'd also lose about the same, right? So we'd lose about 14% of our marsh. If things were simple, if things were so-called additive, um, what we'd expect is we think we'd take the, the orange bar and add it to the purple bar. And so that if we had both sea level rise and grazing, we would predict that we would, if we just had that additive thing, that we'd lose about a third of our salt marsh. Does that make sense? In fact, when we've done the experiment, what you find is this is actually what's gonna happen. So we're gonna lose 86%. So it's not, and, and you know, the way we tend to study things, we were talking over the break about DDT and stuff, you know, we tend to study things in you know, single, single nature, single, you know, I, I do my study on sea level rise. Alexander does a study on low grazing or whatever, and then we come together and we're like, okay, let's add them together. So, so that's a natural thing. But really, really, um, this is what we tend to see, right? Um, it is also possible in some cases that we could have what's called antagonism, which would be the, the average loss is less than these two things added together. So maybe we lose like, we have both these things going on. Maybe we, this, this isn't really what was happening, but maybe, you know, we'd lose 20% or something like that. Um, and then, and we see just evidence of this in different examples. Um, don't need to go in the details here, but suffice it to say, this is um, the effect of pollution and warming on different plankton. And we see, again, synergistic effects. So it's very difficult to predict the impact from just single individual experiments. Um, and so this is the thing where well, I'll be this weekend with Professor uh, Kafala. We have, a, um, uh, we have a project in the East Bay, an environmental justice project, working on stuff and, and, and um, trying to deal with some of this. But in this case, this is a, a paper that just came out. And so we're looking at this, this estuary and they were looking at the effect of um, uh, uh, climate change, uh, 
warming uh, waters and hardened structures, anthropogenic structures, and uh, breakwater. And what they, what they essentially found is that when you add these two things together, um, the warmer waters from um, more frequent El Ninos and more breakwaters to deal with some of those consequences of sea level rise and stuff, um, there's a synergism and we end up seeing fewer fish in the ecosystem. Um, uh, more than you'd predict from either one of those things. And so uh, we're going to be up uh, on Saturday sampling um, uh, this area in East Palo Alto, and this is where we'll, we'll be sampling. In this case, we're, we're looking at, we're going to be building in a, a living, um, so, so to the left here of the picture is um, the sewage treatment plant for the area. And then we're like sort of looking forward here, we're looking into the San Francisco Bay, and right now, it's, um, uh, it's not going to be able to withstand sea level rise. So we're going to build a higher levee to protect the sewage treatment plant because we probably don't want our sewage treatment plant going underwater. But instead of building a concrete levee, we're going to build a living, you know, a plant-filled, soil-dominated levee. And we're going to be looking to see how that um, also acts to help clean the water as well. And so, uh, and so uh, we have that. And then right nearby is this cool facility, which is designed with the synergy in mind, which is we don't know what's going to happen with sea level rise, but we're going to design this area to be a community space. But it's dynamic in that if we do have sea level rise, it's not, not some big, giant, expensive um, house with like solid walls. It's a, an open floor plan. So if we do have some flooding or whatever, the waters can come into the area and go back out. So we can still have some of the benefits of, of community and community gardens and farmers markets and stuff like that, um, but, uh, but do it in a sustainable way. And so all this stuff sort of speaks to trying to um, understand the synergistic effects of stuff. And I would say that that sounds great, but of course we have this as well. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just remind you that question was about climate change. So climate change, the word was said three times in that hour and a half debate. Two times by the moderators, one time by Vice President Harris, no time by um, former President Trump. And so regardless of what you think about uh, you know, who to vote for, um, right? when we talk about these things, we need to have this understanding, this complex understanding of synergism and all these other things. It's hard in some cases to even talk about just the single topic, right? To, to, to get movement on just before we even get to the synergistic stressors. Okay, so what I want you guys to do now is, is a little bit of interaction. So I want you guys to talk to yourself. So in talking about these synergisms, um, I want you guys to see if you can come up with a couple of, uh, of ideas uh, from California and from outside of California. So in terms of coastal and marine management stressors, what might be some examples of um, uh, uh, stressors combining in ways that we couldn't uh, have easily predicted? So it'll take like five minutes, maybe... Table one get together and table two get together and you guys just uh, chat for a couple minutes. The winds also play a role in yeah. Like totally. Like yeah. So 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 good. So so these these single factors that are bad when they act together they sort of reinforce one another. But but more than just additive. So so the, the winds are even stronger. The water stress is even that much greater. Totally good. Good. Other ones. Do people have any, anybody come up with another? Suggestion or idea? Okay, cool. All right, great. So synergisms. Um, we'll just end with talking about some specific examples of some some of the institutional challenges, the institutional issues. So that what we just discussed there, that was great. Um, you know, natural forces primarily, also human interacting with with moving things around. But but what we see in terms of our conflicting priorities which play out into institutional ineffectiveness or, or institutional paralysis or whatever. First and foremost, competition for resources. So I want that view. No, I want that view. Or I need access to the water for my shipping. No, I need the access to the water for my recreation or whatever it is. So competition for resources. Uh, competition for space in particular. So space, especially in the immediate coastal zone, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's just like the Arundo competing for the competing with the salt marsh grass. Like there's only there's only limited real estate here. Um, often doesn't 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 always have to be the case. And there's a lot of work on people trying to figure out how I can have my view and you can have your shipping. But in many cases, 
one of these users that's, that's utilizing a resource um, is going to harm the other. So the shipper might be able to come in and dock at the ship, but then if I want my pretty view for my restaurant, I have a big, you know, quote unquote, ugly ship in the way. So the fact that that individual is using that space degrades my resource of that space. Um, and then we, we also have the issue of, of some outright con conflicting mandates of different agencies. This was perhaps best articulated. So I hope everybody comes to Harry Shearer because uh, we'll talk about that probably. But, um, but uh, uh, a, a classic one here would have been before the Deepwater Horizon. So the entity that we had was called the MMS, the Minerals Management Service, which was a, a arm of the Department of Interior. The, the Western US headquarters of this organization is about 10 miles from us right here. So we're very close to the headquarters. But what we had there is we had inside the same agency, the folks that were charged with leasing out oil and gas or, or wind or, or you know, generating um, uh, 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 leases for people to harvest resources, energy and otherwise. And, and the same people are saying, hey, we got to do this safely. I got to inspect you and make sure that if you're not doing it right, we got to turn, you know, shut you down. So within the same agency, you had some people working to promote the activity, other people working to regulate or potentially restrict the agency. In the wake of the Deepwater Horizon, as we'll hear at some point in the future, um, uh, we had, ended up breaking up into two separate organizations. Um, but even so, they're still part of the U.S. government, right? And so there, there's still potentially conflicting priorities there. And then we might just have outright conflicting values. So some of us might just say, you know what, the view from my restaurant is way more important than shipping, or shipping is way more important than what it looks like from your, from your little restaurant there. Okay, so conflicting priorities are very important and they're non-trivial. Examples of specific institutional ineffectiveness that we have here in California, so specific examples, um, so LCPs, again, we've not talked about the Coastal Commission in detail, but these are local coastal plans. These are the plans to do some type of development within the coastal zone in the state of California um, that have to be approved by the Coastal Commission. So it's the way they influence the development, right? That if, if you don't have that plan, you can't do the development. So they, they're the ones that approve the plans. Um, and so, um, so we start having these uh, up into the, we, we, this really starts to become a thing in the 1980s. But before then, we have people that were before the Coastal Act. So if you go to, uh, we should probably do a class there, I guess, at one point. But because um, you guys have never watched the Rockford Files, right? You don't even know what I when I say rock. You don't even know what that means. Yes, you're so young. Uh, anyway, um, so it's a it's a TV show uh, that a friend of my dad's did um, uh, about this to, this you know crazy detective, right? That kind of goes beyond the law you know, that kind of stuff. But he lived in a trailer in Malibu above Paradise Cove. So that trailer park, Paradise Cove, the restaurant, the pier, all of that there at the end of, basically near the end of Canaan Road, that stuff is all there because it was existing before the LCPs process. So we have some folks that are grandfathered in that are doing the same things and, and have structures and stuff that were the way they've been doing it back in the day. And then if you and I go in and you and I try to put in a restaurant or you and I try to put in a, a whatever, a pier or a mobile home park or whatever, we are held to a different standard, right? We're held to this new standard. So that's one example. Um, offshore wind. So um, much of the technology for offshore wind um, has been developed uh, originally here in California and now in Europe, but a lot of the stuff is being tested here in California, sort of in labs and things of that nature, modeling. But almost none, in fact, right now, none is installed in California. So instead, people that are installing stuff have been going historically to Mexico. So we have some um, uh, installations in Mexico and up in Oregon, but not in California. So even though we've, we've finally gotten to the point where we've leased some areas, one off of San Luis Obispo, one off of Humboldt, we're still a decade or so away from any actual um, uh, turbines going in, right? We need energy. We need all this kind of stuff. But, we, but our bureaucracy blocks the installation of these types of structures, right? Even, even in an exploratory, or historically is blocked, even exploratory areas. Um, 
So I'm not saying that, we, that these are the best thing to do ever, but we have to be able to collect some data. We have to sort of see how they work to know if they're going to work or not. And our bureaucracy, the permitting process is too hard to get through, essentially, which is crazy. We have a lot of wonderful environmental laws, but many of them have had unintended consequences. The classic example here is housing, housing in California, right? So what started off as a great idea, hey, we want to make sure we're looking at the impact of putting, of doing this resource management thing, of putting these houses in. That's great. Let's understand that has become weaponized. So one of my former neighbors um, that uh, used to run a, a tree farm, they had an area in, this is in the valley, where they, where they grow trees for, you know, office parks and people's homes and stuff like that. Um, and uh, would try to do the right thing. So they would try to minimize the use of herbicides and everything, and they, they'd try to be really efficient with water and everything. When, um, and they were one of these people, you know, you, you guys see, the, you guys see the, uh, the big power lines, and there's sort of like grass or whatever underneath them, and there's no development, and, and there, then there's like some houses to the right, houses to the left. Um, so they, one of their areas was, was a place like this, right? And so they were, um, they were growing it, and then they decided they could consolidate some of their operations. So they um, were getting ready to, to get rid of this, of this parcel. And so they said, hey, maybe we could use it for some low-density housing or some other stuff. So they um, started to go through the process, and the, he showed me the environmental impact statement they had to do. It was two feet thick, right? Two feet thick. For an area that already is in the middle of an urban area, it's not like some pristine area out in the middle of an oak woodland or something, right? And so, nevertheless, they went through the process. They were trying to do this thing of, of low-income housing and all this kind of good stuff, and the neighbors kept suing them. Sue, 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 sue. So, under the guise of environmental laws, right? Under the guise of environmental laws. And they probably weren't going to win, but they certainly delayed them. And after about 10 years, these guys finally said, screw it, and they sold it to a developer who's now, I think, going to put in a big office building there or something, right? And so, so like a small vignette, an example, but, but, but how, what's something that, that seems good or seem well-intentioned can be turned on its head at times, right? And, and, and it's become, unfortunately, in many communities, less about doing better for the environment and more about not in my backyard, right? And so, yeah, you guys should have the, the homeless housing in your community, not mine, you know, that kind of stuff. So that, that's a real challenge. Um, we, we, we've reduced this, but at one point, we're up to almost 100 ships anchored off of the port of LA in the middle of the, the COVID pandemic, if you remember that. Um, and that was because we, we just couldn't handle the traffic, right? And so, so the institutional inefficiencies of moving stuff around uh, is, is non-trivial. One of the knock-on effects of that was the Huntington Beach oil spill because one of these ships couldn't anchor, wasn't able to go in the normal parking spot, so it had to anchor their own and didn't do it right and led to the dragging of the line and, and popping open a thing. So that, that's an example. Uh, abalone poaching, when we get to fisheries, we'll talk about abalone. And, and abalone poaching, rampant. So, so where we are right now with abalone is there's no harvesting of any abalone here in, um, in Southern California. No recreational, no commercial, et cetera. Up north in Northern California, um, you can harvest it for recreation purposes, not for commercial purposes, but we frequently have busted people with like a thousand or several hundred abalone in the back of their pickup, right? So, so that's an example of, of the enforcement is not as robust as perhaps it should be um, because people are still doing this because they think they can get away and they won't suffer a penalty. Um, another big one that hopefully we're going to get to a uh, mariculture facility up in uh, Oxnard, in, or not Oxnard, excuse me, up in um, Goleta um, in a few weeks. But, uh, but we had at one point 11 different mariculture facilities in California to grow abalone and other things. Many of them have shut down. And again, it's because of the bureaucracy. It's too hard to get a permit. We should be thinking, hey, these folks are helping us with food supply. These people are helping us with healthy protein from the sea, and yes, we should do it the correct way, but shouldn't we be having more of this? We've been having less of it in California. Um, and so I'd say those are all examples of, of institutional effectiveness, things that should be facilitating these, these responsible uses of resources and instead are causing problems and shoving them away.